fantastic. Uh, well, thanks everyone. Uh, sorry for the uh, another slight change of plans. Uh, one of our panelists uh, could could have the time to to be here, so we're going to continue the format as as it's in the program. So just a quick introduction of myself. I am Andres Vega. I am an international associate at Centurion Law Group. I am originally from Mexico, so I do know the importance of a strong regulator in the industry and how it can impact the, the whole economy, correct? Uh, so to, without uh, no further delay, I will introduce our esteemed panelists, starting by Dr. Pindile Masangane. She is the CEO of the Petroleum Agency in South Africa. And Mr. Belarmino Chitangeleka, the executive administrator of the ANPG in Angola. I will, I will allow a couple of minutes for them to introduce themselves before going to the panel discussions. So Dr. Masangane, if you would like to begin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is this on? Okay. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, the conference organizers, thank you for inviting the Petroleum Agency of South Africa. We, the, we are the upstream oil and gas regulator for the country. So if you want to do any permitting, licensing for any upstream oil and gas uh, activities, you come to the Petroleum uh, Agency of South Africa, and I'm the chief executive of that agency. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Chitangeleka, if you could please make a brief introduction. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Belamino Chitangeleka. I'm a member of the executive board of a National Agency for Petroleum, Gas, and Biofuels of Angola. We are um, regulator as well and also concessionaire. Concessionaire meaning that uh, they um, the mining rights uh, transferred from the government, from the state to the agency, and then we uh, take out from, from there to, um, to associate with the investors for upstream activities of oil and gas. Thank you so much, and glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chitangeleka. So we have uh, prepared a set of questions to start the panel discussion. So I would like to, to begin with uh, Dr. Masangane. If you could, could please uh, uh, talk about, talk with us and the audience a bit of the challenges that PASA, uh, the Petroleum Agency of South Africa, has experienced, has experienced in establishing a, a successful development of the recently final, found oil and gas reserves. Uh, could you please? Um, yeah, first, before I talk about the challenges that we've had in supporting the recent discoveries in our South Coast uh, Block 11 B12B, I think it's worth noting that the latest of these discoveries was actually made right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, which goes on to show the support um, that the South African government will go to in order to support um, exploration and production activities in South Africa. In the middle of that COVID uh, pandemic in 2020, our minister issued the regulations to allow Total and its JV, Total Energies and its JV partners to come and explore in South Africa. At that time, our borders were closed, but we issued special uh, regulations to allow them to bring the vessel and to bring the experts to do the drilling. Unfortunately, because of the world-class company that they are, they drilled safely and uh, declared a second discovery in our south coast. Um, when it comes to the challenges, you will know that uh, we've got a very muted um, domestic gas market. So there isn't a, a, a big offtake, a domestic offtake in our country, and therefore, Part of the challenge that they're meeting in developing this resource is on the offtake side because it's quite a big resource that um, they've discovered. Secondly, unlike our electricity infrastructure, we've got very limited gas infrastructure in the country. And as you know, the discoveries are very deep offshore. Mm -hmm. So they have to build extensive offshore infrastructure to monetize the gas and also to take it to markets because we don't have any distribution gas infrastructure. 
However, as a government, we are focused in supporting them and we'll make sure that uh, this project is developed and comes to production. The target is to bring it to production by December of 2025. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the National Oil and Gas Company is acting as the off-taker in order to bring back to full production the gas to liquid refinery that we have. So there are negotiations around the offtake for that. And also the sharing of the infrastructure because fortunately these discoveries are not too far from uh, the Petro SA um, platform, offshore platform. So they will leverage of that platform. So yes, there are challenges, but we think there are solutions on the way. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, just following up with a couple of questions. So being a, a regulator, um, and especially with these new discoveries about to, to begin, uh, hopefully, production in 2025, as you said, um, how much uh, uh, autonomy, um, how much uh, the sort of, uh, ability to make determinations do you have in controlling the national company, the international companies, and managing also the policy objectives of the government while securing a suitable environment for the industry as a whole. How are you managing uh, that, especially with this fantastic new discoveries? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky balancing act, um, but we do have gui guidance from uh, the National Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. So you want to make sure that it's an equitable distribution of uh, the benefits that will come. So we want to make sure that we maintain that, that, that um, equitable share of the potential benefits that will come. But importantly, we see this uh, project as one that can help us to bring, the, to bring about economic recovery as we come from the pandemic. So government's clear objective at this point in time is to make sure that we've got economic recovery, we create maximum number of jobs, we make sure that um, the local content is as high as possible. So those are the guiding principles that we, we are using. At the same time, we want to make sure that whatever demand we make of the, to the investor to make sure that we address the socioeconomic imperatives that we have of the country, they are not prohibitive to the investment. So not an easy balancing act, but we are walking that tightrope. Okay, fantastic. Not, not an easy balancing act at all, but uh, I hope uh, we, we all wish you, wish you the, the best. Uh, moving along to Mr. Chitangeleka. So uh, after the three years of the establishment of the AMPG, can you tell us what lessons can you share for other petroleum agencies in countries that have just uh, created a, a, a regulator? All right, thank you. Um, uh, we came on the line basically in 2019 as a result of restructuring of our sector, our petroleum sector in Angola. Uh, definitely, um, we started the, the industry in uh, early 1950s and uh, everything went well. At one point in time, we reached a two million barrel oil per day as production in 2008, but uh, then in subsequent years, we were kind of getting inefficient and uh, there was a need for restructuring the industry. Uh, this is when uh, the concessionaire function was transferred from Sonangol to agency, a new uh, regulatory body. Of course, uh, we face challenges, and um, one of them is um, production natural decline. And we were uh, some um, few years without conducting licensing rounds to, in order to um, to get the more um, exploration, to get new resources into the system. So our production has been dropping. This is a challenge that uh, the concessionaire uh, is uh, facing. Uh, currently, and uh, one of the mission is to maximize value for the government, uh, for the state of Angola. And so um, we basically do uh, the business based on three types of contracts, uh, production sharing contracts. Is, uh, we have a contract uh, called the uh, association and the also risk contract. So it's a challenge because um, we need to uh, look um, at the cost uh, so that, uh, of course, then the, um, um, 
we can uh, maximize the value of oil that is then shared between the uh, investors and the state. So it's been a challenge and also uh, not only on the production but also taking care of the local content. Uh, we needed to uh, potentialize the um, Angolan industry using uh, petroleum resources so that we can uh, uh, one of these days, we can have more companies involved with the, uh, in the national industry and uh, also help to maximize value for, for the state of Angola. Um, many challenges. Uh, another one could be how we can um, have the competencies in place. And now that also we are sending, uh, mixing messages that uh, we are on a uh, energy transition, uh, somebody can take that, okay, there is no more enough uh, oil exploration. So, but at one point, how are we going to uh, convince the youth to, um, to come to the industry to help us uh, to fulfill what we have established as an um, uh, exploration strategy for the next few years so that we can find new resources and develop them at uh, those fields we produce for 20 or more years. So that's a challenge we are facing. Thank you so much. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Chitangileka. On, on that note, yeah, I, I agree it's important for the regulator to maximize the value for the government, of course. But it's also important, and I don't know if you agree with me, to, for the regulator to keep a diligent, vigilant eye on the companies, on the concessionaires, and all of the, and all of the contract holders and keep approving or disapproving their development plans and exploration plans and whatnot. Always, of course, looking to maximize the value for the government, but to, to also protect the industry to, to avoid any decrease in production and always to, to, to be pro-investment. Pro so on, on that note, and being that the agency is relatively new, how have you found uh, the, the, the time or the, or the skills that can assist you in all of this really strong hard work that is, well, entering into a PSC, which can take years uh, or, or, or just a few months, or approving a development plan, which is also pretty hard work. How, are you, how, how has been your experience with uh, finding this skilled uh, Ang Angolan uh, uh, workers? that can assist, uh, assist the, the agents in this mission? Uh, that's a good question. First of all, we have transferred the people from uh, Sonangol to the new concessionaire, so we got the skills. Of course, uh, we need to continue uh, preparing people, training people. Um, actually, uh, one of the issue is to, uh, to improve, to get more efficiency in uh, all projects, how, do, how we can develop them efficiently, how we can also uh, run uh, aging facilities that uh, cause us a lot of uh, non-productive time. Mm -hmm. um, based on this, uh, we got um, to continue training. We send people to um, uh, international companies, uh, premises or facilities to train uh, our people. And fortunately, uh, all the big ones, uh, Chevron, Exxon, BP, Total, are still with us. And they promised, and I, I hope they will keep the promise that they will stay in Angola. And uh, together, uh, the, our success has been built in, in a partnership with them. So. Uh, training has been one of the challenges we needed to, to, um, uh, to take care of our people, and uh, I think we've been successful. Um, that, that's, it. that's it. Okay, uh, yeah, fantastic. Of course, yeah, I mean, you have a, a fantastic industry that is expected to, be, to continue its growth now with all of the new policies that uh, are in place. Uh, so that, thanks, thanks for the thanks for the answer. It's uh, it's really interesting for me coming uh, in my country. It worked uh, differently. So the NOC had uh, full control of the industry. Then the regulator was created and given more authority, and then the international companies came in. So with you it was um, sort of getting created and 
taking control of the industry, which is a bit, it's a bit more of a challenge, I can, I can imagine. Uh, okay, so uh, moving along to, to other questions. Um, uh, do you think, uh, uh, Dr. Masangane, um, that it would be feasible to create some, let's call them African standards within the regulators in the different African countries and communicate with each other um, for, the, for the development of initiatives or, or, or the uh, uh, standardized, just to call it this way, growth of the, of the African industry? Is there a way the agencies can communicate effectively? Do you think it's possible? Yeah, I think it, it is very possible, and I think it's important that it happens um, as the world um, is being mindful of the impact of uh, climate change. And the, the South African regulator actually is mindful of the fact that there is a need to transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, the upstream oil and gas uh, industry has no choice but to follow suit. And therefore, if we can come together as the upstream oil and gas um, industry regulators to set standards that will make sure that our sector as well lowers its carbon emissions. As you know, with us, the fugitive emissions in terms of our operations have got a devastating impact on the economy. So just arresting those, um, those emissions will go a long way in making sure that we contribute towards lowering uh, carbon emissions um, in the world. So I think it's very important and we can, I mean the collaboration would also make sure that um, the whole of Africa contributes towards a cleaner energy future. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Correct, and we will, we will go into that topic in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, uh, Mr. Chitangeleka, do you have any comment? Uh, you, you've been a... Uh, uh, a regulator yourself, uh, how in a way you, you can contribute with other regulators to have this standardized uh, industry? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, one experience we know, um, for example, for equipment that are brought in the country from the outside, uh, every operator has their choice to, to uh, implement the technology and the equipment. Then we end up with the, uh, a huge inventory um, of equipment that nobody else uses. Just an example, we have uh, Block 17 that at one time had the, uh, seven uh, deep water rigs, but those rigs uh, working on different fields, meaning that the different projects, uh, they couldn't uh, exchange equipment. And being uh, in a country, um, in the past we used to call remote because uh, if you order equipment for one well, you better add, um, add another well, meaning that you order for two wells, but actually you will not use the two uh, well equipment for one. There will be always part of the equipment that is left over, but nobody would use it. So it's important to standardize um, some of the equipment. One thing also, I think Africa needs to talk more to each other to, um, uh, to exchange. In the region, we are on the West Africa. Uh, we could, um, we have the uh, same operators basically uh, in Nigeria, uh, Gabon, uh, Ghana, Angola, but we may know, or they may know that the equipment that they use there is also used in our country. And we have a construction yards uh, where uh, we fabricate some of the equipment that we can exchange, but it looks like uh, the option is always to bring from America or from uh, Europe. So we need to standardize and the collaboration will be a must for us. Of course, yeah, that, that, is a really, that is a really important point. That's, that's actually a great idea to have uh, using the regulators as a channel of communications of, hey, I have this equipment here, or I have this issue here, or, or particularly now going to the topic of lower carbon emissions, and um, particularly in, the, in exploration opportunities with these new, with all, all of this, what's happening now in the industry. How are, you, um, how are you sensing the, that the current market conditions are affecting exploration opportunities in, in both of your countries? Uh, starting with uh, Dr. Masangane, please. 
I mean, for us, we are sending a clear message around the fact that um, we will continue to exploit these resources, mm. but we just want to make sure that we contribute towards decarbonization of the world. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we are going to develop the standards, and therefore, that's why the cooperation with other regulators from our side would be uh, very, very important. So we don't see the, the companies uh, slowing down investment uh, in the short term. And um, as we're saying at the plenary session, what we are seeing is that as the different economies come out of the pandemic and want to grow, there is an evident shortfall of energy supply uh, globally. So yes, um, all companies are mindful of the need to, to, um, to use less fossil fuels, but unfortunately the low carbon technologies are not yet readily available and are not yet commercially uh, competitive with fossil fuel. So Africa, I believe, is still going to use um, its resources, at least in the short to medium term, mm -hmm. and only after that will the other technologies start to take over. So this is the time for Africa, actually, and we see a lot of growing investments. Um, and, and as regulators, it would be great to cooperate. I mean, the idea from my colleague of making sure that the cost of exploration and production is also driven down through the cooperation of the regulators. I think it's really a, a wonderful idea. And, and I think as, as we um, come together to make sure that we maximize investments in Africa, it will benefit the African people. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Chitangaleka. How is uh, the Angola and the AMPG managing uh, exploration opportunities? How do you think, how do you see the the market conditions affecting exploration. I know Angola is uh, implementing a lot of policies currently. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on, on those? For, uh... Uh, okay. Um, basically, uh, before pandemic, uh, we were embarking into the exploration mode because we approved the uh, the government approved the exploration strategy um, that last three years we have a ENI striking oil and blocks they are operating mm -hmm. and um, uh, we have the uh, currently as we speak a uh, well that is the deepest well in the water depth is being drilled by um, uh, Total mm -hmm. Total Energies. Uh, we have licensing around since 2019. Um, the objective is to award about 50 plus blocks. That we are in the frontier um, basin like Namibia here, very close to Namibia, South Africa. And uh, we are also planning to start um, uh, searching for oil in, in, in the country basins. Um, so um, I guess the, um, for us is to press on the next few years and find a new uh, oil. There are promises that um, we will have our operators, current operators, and the ones that are coming into the country to do this work. Um, next year, we will have 13 deep water rigs. Uh, perhaps 50% of them will be dedicated to um, exploration. Um, in the past, uh, once you have a concession and um, find oil, you declare commercial oil, you enter in a development mode. Uh, then the production, uh, exploration no more because you're done with the mm -hmm. exploration. But now the law has been changed that uh, you can do exploration in development areas. So many uh, of the existing production uh, assets or fields we undergo uh, exploration work and it's easier because we already have facilities and so they find uh, up deep, down deep resources or upsides and uh, once they can uh, strike oil there, they tie back, tie in in existing facilities. So I think uh, we are not uh, slowing down. Um, our objective is to reach again a replacement rate in terms of reserves to production above 100%. Um, we have a um, uh, perspectivity which we cannot change, is good. Well, we have been changing law, uh, regulating it better to attract more investment. 
Okay, that, that's good. Uh, so, uh, so I understand there's still a lot of appetite of international oil companies to do exploration in, in Angola. As you said, um, in, in most contracts and concessions, once they discover oil, they'll, they, they stop exploring. Is there any policy or regulation that the agency is taking now to mandate the concessionaires or the PSC holders to keep exploring some minimum work obligations or exploration objectives? How can you talk about a bit of, on that topic? Uh, yes, uh, uh, minimum work program uh, with the different periods is, um, is one uh, normal model we do, but uh, now uh, if um, there are some prospects that are not of interest for who is operating on the area, uh, we, we ask to relinquish and uh, to, um, to put, uh, uh, actually um, a few months ago, another law was approved that uh, allow a permanent um, last uh, permanent award, permanent award of blocks, mm -hmm, instead mm -hmm. of waiting until a decree would be uh, elaborated to give permission, there will be always something on the market that uh, any investor can uh, bid and uh, enter the, uh, the industry. So that is one innovation we have uh, currently, which is good. Um, yes, this one we allow, and also uh, during the years uh, we've, we've, we found um, very big accumulations uh, of oil. Uh, as you know, the strategy usually uh, the oil company will leave behind the small ones and uh, concentrate on the bigger ones. Um, the small ones tend to be marginal. Now we have also a law, a decree that allow uh, new incentives in, in terms of fiscal terms to develop these um, small accumulations that are scattered around uh, deep water, shallow water, onshore. So this, all these will contribute to advance the industry and our uh, resource base. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Masangani, is, uh, is there something similar occurring in, in South Africa? I mean, how are you uh, mandating uh, companies to keep exploring? How are you promoting exploration to have new discoveries and not just keep the ones uh, that you've su successfully made? Yes, um, like in Angola, we also have minimum work programs that we impose on our licensees. So we make sure that they keep doing more work. And um, of course, we have a limit in terms of our exploration right period as well. Mm. And the um, licensees and our operators know that if that com time comes to an end and we do not see that the company was collecting enough data, was aggressively doing ex exploration um, activities, mm. we do recommend to our minister to terminate that exploration right. It's, it's in our interest to make sure that exploration is um, accelerated. As you know, South Africa, unlike Angola, is still very much an exploration region. Mm. We are not yet a, a high production country, so we want to make Make sure that our operators are incentivized to accelerate towards uh, the production phase. Fantastic. And uh, how do you see the appetite of uh, international companies, independents, maybe even uh, local companies in doing exploration? Uh, how's the market working? Uh, can, you, can you tell us about that? So we do have the, um, um, the big oil companies in the country mm -hmm. as well, Total and Shell now, I think are the leading ones. Um, so they, uh, as always, have the bigger appetite. And then we've got so a good balance uh, between the, the male, oil, uh, male ma oil majors, uh, the juniors, and the middle-sized companies as well as local companies. So we've got a nice balance between uh, the three classes of exploration companies in the country. Okay, fantastic. So um, uh, we're, we're moving ahead in, in time. So I'm just gonna do a couple of more questions and then allow the audience to maybe do a, have a small Q&A session before finishing. So uh, again with you, uh, Dr. Masangane. So now, uh, now that hydrocarbons are uh, gaining favor as a viable refrigerant, alternative and so many other things. Um, 
how can how can countries like South Africa can um, can benefit from strategic partnerships to take uh, advantage of this other derivative of hydrocarbons? So South Africa has done a lot of strategic partnerships in the region. I think a good example is um, our partnership with Mozambique. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we tended to be a bigger market of take markets than the Mozambique, and, and therefore we built a pipeline between the two countries more than 20 years ago. That saw the monetization of the um, Panditamane gas fields in Mozambique uh, coming to South Africa, to Sasso, which is one of our big industrial companies. So we are used to partnerships in the region. And of course, the big find in Mozambique, coupled now with our find, um, and our ministers in the SADC region have come together to say, how do we build a gas um, transportation infrastructure that will see all this gas in the region being used to uplift um, the region in totality? So yes, it is a time uh, for us to partner with each other uh, and um, the, the, the location and the spread of where these fines are is such that we both can, South Africa and Mozambique, for example, can benefit from the northern fines where else the south can be used for, for other um, projects in the southern part of the economy. So yes, partnership is important to make sure that um, these uh, projects are monetized in the quickest time possible as well as just to re-industrialize the, 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 the region. You know, as you know, most of the resources historically have been exported. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that it's time for us to build big beneficiation centers. And of course, each country can have a specialty on what um, beneficiation project they have, rather than exporting um, all these resources out of the region. Fantastic. Uh, Mr. Chitangaleka, anything uh, you'd like to add? And I, I would add to the question, uh, how important do you think in West Africa, for example, is to, to have these partnerships with uh, neighboring countries, especially now that we have uh, countries are aiming to decarbonization? Uh, yes, uh, as far as I know, uh, we have um, established uh, recently some uh, uh, agreements to build a um, oil pipeline uh, um, to Zambia and uh, I, I believe there is a lot of opportunity to uh, interconnect um, the industry within the region and Africa in general. Uh, we have the Congo, so we, um, we have a, a gas production uh, LNG plant. Um, uh, one of the drawback at the moment, uh, we initially, our industry focused on oil production. Whenever we drill the well that uh, didn't have oil, but gas, we called it a dry, a dry hole, dry well. Now uh, we are in a um, mission to, to do the accountant to see how much gas we have, but gas will be one thing that we can exchange rapidly uh, in the region, um, construct gas lines, uh, et cetera. And uh, yeah, we believe that uh, there is a great opportunity for us to work together on that regard. And uh, as gas is going to be um, for a while, remain in the matrix equation, in the energy matrix, uh, we believe that the gas can be uh, one of the products that we will be sharing in the future as the market, as my colleague said, uh, oil, we always export them, probably 90% of the oil we exported always. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, uh, just now that you mentioned uh, this, uh, in this data that whenever you find a well that was only gas, you just didn't uh, want for it. What is the policy now of the agency regarding this stranded wells or gas flaring or just utilization of this gas now that it's such an important resource, especially now in the market conditions with towards decarbonization? As the agency has a specific objective, a plan, some regulations in place 
to take advantage of the associated gas, for example, or stranded wells? Yes, definitely we have. Associated gas at the moment is all sent to the LN Angola LNG plant. Um, no associated. We have uh, gas monetization law was passed the last, last two years, and uh, so that uh, investors now have access to that resource. But mm -hmm. before, when we find, when you found the gas is for the state and they don't touch it. Now it's part of the business. And this is improving also the uh, business landscape because not only oil, you have another resource and when you do your economics, it uh, looks good. And um, so, but of course uh, we have uh, still uh, a need to develop infrastructure for gas. There is a lot of gas waiting on a pipe. Uh, so we'll be uh, monetizing guys. That is what is called the the, uh, the new law, mon gas monetization. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. And there's a, a a lot of companies that would be interested in just taking that gas out of your hands, of course, and transforming it into other byproducts that can be sold in the region, which is always interesting. So uh, I think we're 15 minutes from our allocated time. So I would. Uh, Thank you very much for your, for your answers. And I would just uh, go to the audience now if you have any questions you want to make for our panelists. Uh, can we have a microphone for the, can you help me with that again? Mm. Or well, it's a small place, so. Can I share a mic? Thank you, Megan. Uh, thank you so much, our panelists and uh, the moderator. We've uh, learned quite a lot. Just two questions, uh, three. Two, one for South Africa, for doctor, and two for Angola, certainly. Yeah. Given what is pertaining uh, for you, doctor, uh, uh, the energy transition discourse and whatever is happening around it, COP, now Africa Energy Week, is there a working definition of energy transition in South Africa, and what is it? And then two simple questions for uh, Angola. Uh, one is the simple one, is uh, what's the future of the energy sector as you see it? And uh, the second one is uh, what is... Um, the risk of the possibility of stranded assets, especially given the energy transition discourse. Thank you. South Africa definitely does have a definition of uh, energy transition. It's um, articulated in our Integrated Resource Plan 2019, that's in respect of electricity. It's in the Gas Master Plan, which is currently under development. If you look at the Integrated Resource Plan, it's very clear that we are moved to, moving towards a low carbon energy system and building a lot of renewable energy capacity. But that renewable energy capacity, because of it, its intermittency, also requires that we build a large uh, gas-powered um, fire generation to make sure that we have the flexibility that's needed to make the, sure that the electricity supply system re remains adequate. We have just, uh, as a country, um, finalized our nationally determined contribution for now, going to COP26. Of course, as you know, our president is committing to more aggressive greenhouse gas emission reductions. So that's why that's calling for a revision of the gas master plan. And we are now developing the gas master plan. For, but from what the indications we see so far is that gas will remain very much a transition fuel for us as South Africa. As you know, we're coming from a coal dependency. So therefore, gas allows us to cut our emissions by more than 50%. It helps us to complement the renewable energy technology build program that we have. So in short, our definition of a transition is renewables coupled with gas and of course bringing in cleaner uh, coal technologies so that we can continue to use our coal um, resources that we have. Thank you. Okay, let's see if I remember the questions. Uh, <laughs> the first one, feature of energy. Um, 
Yeah, definitely. Um, we we are promoting petroleum, uh, oil and gas projects uh, to support the future um, uh, renewable projects. And it, it, this will take some time. We are aware that uh, we don't want, we will avoid um, uh, energy poverty at all costs. Uh, the only way we have, at least for our situation, is to continue with the oil exploration and production. And I don't see, uh, well, there is a risk, everything has a risk, but um, we, we believe that uh, standard assets may be not uh, foreseen on the in the near future, because um, we still have um, to develop our country. Uh, even in industry, general industry, we need um, electricity from uh, those sources, uh, oil, and mainly gas, because as we go, probably gas will be the most focused objective to, uh, to achieve uh, our objectives. Um, so I don't see, uh, I'm not a futurist, but uh, we will get the, um, the industry going uh, for many years. Thank you for the questions. Thank you. Is there, oh, thank you. Hi. My question is for the, for the doctor for the Petroleum South Africa Agency. It's just to, to check in terms of how do you strike the balance being a, a regulator and playing an oversight role in terms of the exploratory activities and also, and also still at the same time ensuring that you encourage investment uh, in terms of the upstream business without compromising uh, the, the relevant standards you know, with the, the investors. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and <laughs> as I said uh, in part of my remarks earlier on, it's, it's not an easy balance to strike, but it's a very important balance to strike, you know, maximizing the benefit of these resources to the South African people, while at the same time making sure that the investor remains inve incentivized and see the um, financial benefit of continuing with um, the investment. So it's not, it's not that easy a balance to, to, to make. And as you know, for a very long time, uh, South Africa used its fiscal framework to make sure that it's very favorable. So the government take was very low, and in actual fact, I think it was the lowest in the region for a very long time because we knew that we are still an exploration region. Is that fair? Someone else can say that uh, revenues from these natural resources is the biggest benefit that a government has, and we should have maximized that from the beginning. We chose not to do that, but rather to use it as an instrument to attract investment. But from our side, what we do make sure that we are, what we do want to make sure is that, for example, local content is maximized, and that benefits uh, our local industry skills are developed, uh, local skills are developed, and we make sure that there is employment of our people. So those were some of the sites that we're using to make sure that there is maximum benefit to our people. Uh, the Minister of Finance will be giving the medium term uh, budget uh, speech on Thursday, I think day after tomorrow. So you, I'm hoping that he will announce that of course we'll have a new fiscal framework. Again, we will see that hopefully we're not going to move our fiscal framework aggressively because we want to up the government take, but we don't want to up it too aggressively to scare away investors. So I believe that there is an equitable share in South Africa between government ask as well as the investor take and the benefit to the people of South Africa. Thank you. Is there any other question for our panelists? If that's, that's it, then um, I will just thank our panelists, Dr. Mr. Chitangeleka, thank you very much for the really interesting conversation and we wish you the best of luck in this really ambitious endeavor of uh, governing an, an, an agency. And so if you can just stand up and I will just ask the audience for a round of applause for our esteemed panelists. And thank you very much.